Not that long ago, only a few people lived life through a lens, projected onto the public retina. Now, after a decade and a half of Facebook, everyone has a brand. Everyone curates an image. This group of mid-twenties professionals have grown up in the Facebook era. I was suddenly aware that I had to kind of curate and present a kind of image of myself to the outside world. And it was something that, that I was totally in, in control of and that I could stylize. The person I am in re reality is a bit more relaxed, chilled out in my sweatpants or whatever. Online, it's like very much a different version of myself, I think. A part of my life has always been on the internet for other people to just go and look at at any point. I don't know if I necessarily think about it always being there and people judging me for it, but right now I am. <laughs> <laughs> and the real world is being redesigned to look perfect in our screens. Toilets, believe it or not, get extremely Instagram. And we designed this one to be extremely bright and red and very, very saturated. So whoever takes a picture of that is kind of blinding on Instagram. It pops out yeah. and it gets a lot of likes. Aphrodite Crasser runs a design studio that helps restaurants become Instagrammable. The minute the food arrives on the table, they will take pictures of it and post it online. And you have as an operator to ask yourself, what does this look like? You know, how does it become recognizable as me? How can I promote what I do through this one picture? How do I tell my story? And this is exactly what we do when we design our spaces, our restaurants. We really think of all of these parameters and when this moment happens and try to curate the frame effectively and curate that moment. But there is evidence that this constant curation is taking its toll, particularly on young minds. We know that people tend to present themselves in a, in a more favourable way on social media platforms where they are going to present you know, the benefits of the positives of their lives rather than anything negative that has happened. And it may, to a certain extent, lead to um, the pressure to perform, the pressure to be better, and also the pressure to engage on a regular basis with social media platforms such as Facebook. And in certain circumstances, this can have a negative impact on mental health and well-being. So perhaps we need to rediscover who we are without the filters of social media. Recently, I think as I'm getting older, there is that kind of notion that I need to be present. Like when I'm out with friends that I shouldn't just be, you know, scrolling or like taking an Instagram story or whatever, to actually be there and have the phone like in the bag away from it all and have that weird kind of, you know, normal human interaction, not just through the phone. When Apple released their screen time, stats recently it was actually shocking how much time I spent on social media because I felt as a person I didn't go on it that much but I was spending like 16 hours a week on it which is obscene I was thinking imagine if I spent that time like reading books or speaking French or something it'd be completely different. It does sort of ruin social nights out and actually uh, I sometimes go like night clubbing and there's like policies at these clubs where like you can't take your phone out you can't take pictures because it sort of ruins the vibe for everyone if everyone starts like taking pictures on the dance floor. Perhaps then we're heading for a backlash the whole Instagrammable element of restaurants is destroying a lot of times the experience. You know? Really? What, you yeah. see people around yeah. a table and they're all on their phones taking I, it? I, I go with all these chefs and operators and food arrives and I'm about to enjoy it. I'm Greek, I look at food, I just want to eat it. And they go, no, 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 please stop, do not touch anything. And they spend 10 minutes trying to get the right angle, post it, post the right picture. Then they're checking how many people are liking it. And in the end, you're not enjoying what you're eating. You're not conscious of what you're eating. You're just consuming in an un unconscious level. So the restaurant experience as such is actually subordinate. It's secondary to the what it looks like to the outside world. To, to a certain extent, yes. To certain That's people, madness, not. <laughs> well, everything is madness nowadays. I think this is one part of madness. <laughs> David Grossman, well, I'm joined now by Catherine Omerod, who is the author of Why Social Media is Ruining Your Life and editor of Work, 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 a website designed to highlight the fantasy of social media. Amy Orban is a lecturer for Oxford University specialising in the effects of social media on human interaction. She joins us from, Insta from Instagram, from Amsterdam. Thank you both very much indeed for enjoying this. First of all, Catherine, um, you were on social media virtually 24-7 as a journalist and influencer. Yeah. Um, you essentially were a brand. Yeah, essentially that's the way it worked and there was a, a really um, tight moment between being a journalist and being an influencer in that it kind of 
they, they became so synonymous at a certain point of you know the way social media had developed. So essentially you were enhancing and curating your life. Exactly. And now then there was a particular image and I don't know if that was what triggered it but a particular image which then you wrote about which we can see now coming on the screen which makes you look as if you're just you're just on top of your game you're yeah. very happy but what was going on at that time? So I was at New York Fashion Week and as you can see I'm wearing all of the fashionable clothes and looking like everything's really glossy but Actually, a couple of months before, my husband had just left me and um, I was in like really bad debt. It was a really, really difficult time. But in the interim, I'd kind of had a bit of a rebound and I was meant to be meeting the guy in New York for a couple of days. A guy, not your ex-husband. Not the ex-husband, another one. I mean, this is looking really good for me at the moment. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, I, I arrived at the hotel room waiting to see him. We we're going to have this romantic weekend and he didn't turn up. And left you with the bid debt. He left me with the, the bill so this as was well. A lie. It was it it was a moment in the day. I mean, yeah. I was obviously there and I was wearing yeah. those clothes. But that's but it, not how you felt. It wasn't representative. No. Amy, uh, do you recognise this pressure that people feel on social media to be on, to be at the top of their game, to present their best face, the, the, the people with lots of friends and so forth, and that is actually damaging themselves. That actually they then think the reality of their lives is really not very good. I think who we present on social media is really interesting for, especially for me as a social psychologist and a lot of researchers, because previously, before social media, we could be different personas to different groups of people. So for example, who I am to my parents is very different to who I'm for my students. But on Instagram, on Twitter, or on Facebook, we are presenting ourselves to the whole world at times. Um, and that is an inherent pressure because all of a sudden we're presenting the same persona to a lot of different groups. And so I can see that platforms like Instagram make us react differently and, and present us differently because it's a whole different social situation and we aren't, aren't accustomed to being the same person for, for everyone. And also, do you recognize that can put absolutely psychological mental pressure on people that, uh, that causes bad feelings about yourself? It's really hard for us to, at the moment, to say what actually is happening to people when they're using social media because social media is so diverse. And at the moment, for example, most of our viewers will probably won't be having an Instagram lifestyle where they have over 50,000 followers. And they'll probably have a very different situation on social media, maybe yes, connecting with be. other friends. They might be, well, but they might be, old oh, sorry to interrupt, sorry to interrupt, I know we've got a delay in the line, but they might actually have friends they have not seen for a long, long time. And actually what they're telling their friends essentially is a lie because their lives are not like that. And I wonder, did you, do you feel better, Catherine, for being more honest? Oh, for sure. But I, I definitely think it's like a universal thing. I don't think it's a niche issue. I think it doesn't matter what your background, how much money you have, anything. We all want to present the best version of ourselves. Yes, you know? and, and what about the idea that in David Grossman's film there, they, you know, they're designing restaurants now around what looks good on social media. I mean, and, and you were saying that people actually have, can actually hire someone. Yeah, you can have a social media concierge come to any event, but you know, every shop in the world now is designed to be shareable. That's that's the whole world. It's it's it isn't specifically to a hotel or a restaurant. Our world is shareable. Well, I wonder about the dangers of being on all the time, Amy. And in the front pages tomorrow, uh, we have the story both in the Daily Mail and indeed in the Times that the, the social media phone use in schools is going to be banned. Minister, uh, the schools minister, Nick Gibb, warns of the danger of children uh, arriving next day at school tired as well. Um, the LSE found in a study that test results rise by more than 6% if the, the use of uh, video games, tablets and phones is corralled for children. Um, is that something that you have looked into? I think what's really important to say here is that we've had a parliamentary committee look into this and they published their results only just a couple of days ago, the Science and Technology Select Committee, and we have worked with that and they have worked directly with researchers. And they have actually found that we don't have the evidence yet to say what effect social media is having because social media is so diverse. And so um, a lot of statements made in the media 
are taking social media as one thing having an inherently negative effect. And that evidence for social media as a whole having a negative effect isn't there yet because social media can be anything from looking at Instagram models to um, connecting with your school friends after school. And we can't, those questions are not nuanced enough yet for us to actually give clear results. And so at the moment, I'd say that the evidence is really sparse from the academic perspective, even if it looks like it's not from the public conversation and the conversations we're having in the media. But do you have to be quite strong to resist the temptation to curate your life? Of course. I mean, who wants to admit vulnerability to the entire world? You know, it's not easy to stand up and say, you know what, things have really gone wrong in my life. It's, it's really tough to do that. And I think the more people that do it, obviously it's like a domino effect, isn't it? And people see the power of honesty. Thank you both very much indeed.